Today I speak with Sarah, the midwife mama from TikTok. I was really keen to have Sarah on to tell us about the horrors of childbirth. I did this in a bid to encourage women to value themselves more and better qualify their partners for the long term, whilst also attempting to inspire men to see and appreciate their spouses now for the eventual struggle that their partners will have to face. Couples are often too short-sighted in their appreciation for one another. It is important to recognise a spouse's long-term qualities to ensure your relationship stands the test of time. Sarah and I discuss miscarriage, postpartum depression, weight gain, vaginal tearing and the soaring of the pelvic bone. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for listening and enjoy. So welcome back to the Relationship Advocates podcast where we're encouraging young people to get in and stay in relationships. We're very lucky to have Sarah on today who's also known as the midwife mama on social media and um, I'll let Sarah introduce herself first and then I'm going to help frame the reason why I've brought her on because it's very important and very related and I want to explain to you in detail why I've asked Sarah to come on today to, to help us better understand relationships. So Sarah, if you wouldn't mind, please give us an introduction of yourself and um, if you're in a relationship, we love a how you met your partner story. So please give us an intro. Yeah, so I'm I'm Sarah. I um, live near St. Louis in the United States. I've been a nurse for 15 years, um, specializing in women's health as a nurse practitioner for 14 and a midwife for five. Um, I currently work in private practice, um, helping um, deliver babies. And then in my free time, I, I am married. Um, my husband and I met on a blind date. Um, worked out and um i stayed in the midwest i'm originally from california we have two children so that's me <laughs> i'm 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 building a bit of uh i'm trying to understand a trend so i'm gonna ask you a few questions on the back of that how soon after meeting or dating did you get married and how soon after getting married if you don't mind me asking did you have children um we dated for two years before we got married we were engaged after one and then we started trying right away. There's a little bit of an age difference. Um, so my husband wanted to get going. Um, but it did take us a little while, about a year. About a year after we got married, we welcomed our son, Nolan. That's amazing. That's brilliant. Well, let me explain. I, I don't even think I've fully explained to you, Sarah, sort of the framing of the reason why you've come on. There's, there's many levels to it. But in my study, if I can call it study, um, in, I'll call it study. In my study of pregnancy and childbirth itself, what I've come to find is there's an... How can I word this? Men don't appreciate... Men appreciate... I hear that husbands and fathers appreciate their wives so much post-childbirth. And it's almost as if these stories are lost because I, I feel like these stories could be used to inform young men to appreciate young women in terms of where they're going to end up being, where they're going to end up going. And I think young people are so hooked and obsessed with their 20s. Like they don't can't imagine life beyond 30. They can't imagine childbirth. But these stories and understanding the bigger picture of life, which essentially is the bigger pic picture of your relationship and the events that actually take place, I think women are losing out on a huge degree of appreciation that they should be getting from their partners way before a child even presents itself or is even in the sphere. Because at the end of the day, that is the that is the magic that women provide the world that no one else can. And I don't think they're appreciated enough for it, which is the reason why I brought you on. And equally, I don't think women themselves appreciate themselves in that way. So I think when women are going and qualifying their men they're, they're trying to be with, they don't understand the horrors that can take place, thank God they don't as often now, can take place during childbirth and, and sort of, not horrors, but the struggle of the whole process. Careful who you're choosing, you know? Be careful who you're choosing, what type of man you're aligning yourself with. If you guys are, your the main gripe in your relationship is who he, whose pictures he liking, who's liking on Instagram, you've got no hope of, 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 of working through this amazing thing that is childbirth, you know? Yeah, I mean, having a child changes the entire relationship. 
Um, and if you as a woman are primarily doing all of the things to hold up your relationship, you will still be doing that once you have a child. Um, I find it really hard for people to trans transition into that role and they women feel like they have to just keep doing it all. But um, you really need a supportive partner to understand that things are changing and things will continue to change and those maybe those jobs or those things that you did before have to become different for you guys to grow together as a couple. I, I agree entirely. Well, so I please uh, a quick shout, please like and subscribe to support the channel. But do I think we should get into it. I've listed some topics I'd, I'd sort of like to discuss with you in terms of and, and for anyone listening, we are picking out the horror stories. Childbirth is a beautiful thing, but I am keen and thank you so much, Sarah, for coming on. I am keen to highlight things that could go wrong. And the reason I'm doing this is so you can appreciate one another even more. So when you're dating, when you're dating, you're preparing yourself for this. It's not about YOLO. It's not about having fun. It's we're trying to build a foundation such that we can endure these things that life will bring. So let's start off. And, and uh, you're free to sort of take control here, Sarah, and flow the conversation where you feel appropriate. Um, I've just got the list here that, that I sent to you. I think let's start with miscarriage. Yes. So miscarriage is a lot more common, unfortunately, that people even know. And now we're finding out earlier and earlier because of these advanced um, technologies that we have. I mean, we pretty much can know within days um, of a pregnancy. And for a woman who's trying to conceive, it's so exciting. And the moment you get that positive, it really changes your outlook. You become a mom in your heart. You're a mom. It's, it's already in there. And then to lose that baby weeks later, because most of them do occur before 12 weeks, it's devastating. And the things I hear people say like, Oh, don't worry. We'll try again. Or, Oh, don't worry. The next one will be fine. Those, those aren't super helpful. Um, women really do have to grieve that loss and it, it might be harder for their partner to understand because the baby wasn't inside them. They didn't already form this bond and this connection. So instead of maybe just being like, yeah, you'll be fine, even just listening and talking about it, because then what do you do once you've miscarried? Do you have to go through a procedure to, to complete the pregnancy? Do you have to take medication that's going to help you? Will you be in pain and bleeding for days? Like you have to have someone there. And if you miscarry at home, that can equally be as devastating because normally you're by yourself. Um, it's really, really hard. And any loss I tell people is a loss. You, you have to grieve that loss. It's not something you can just get over. Um, so I think that's probably the hardest and that people expect as soon as they get pregnant, everything's going to be wonderful and fine. And for a lot of couples, it's not. One in four women miscarry. It's so, so damn common. My, I, when I, as I got older, I realized my mother miscarried. I didn't know that. The, the prince, both princesses miscarried, I believe, um, uh, in, in the royal family here in the UK. I, I mean, I could name so many. Who else was I reading about? Yeah, another sort of famous person, just to put it in perspective for people, uh, I think Elon Musk's, actually, that was, I think, a still, I think that was after birth, the, the, the child passed away. But that's by the by, miscarry, miscarrying is so common. It's almost, it's almost you have to expect it. That's where it is. That's where miscarriage is. Yeah, I mean, I see it multiple times a week. Um, so it's really important for me when patients come in for their appointments, I do the ultrasound before they see me. Um, that way, because if I get super excited in their visit and we're talking about baby and then they go have an ultrasound and their baby is not alive, that's even more devastating. So um, yeah, I always ultrasound people before I bring them in to talk to me and then, and then we can kind of go from there because it does happen so often. Am I correct in assuming that even though you've sort of had your first baby, everything is fine, you can still sort of miscarry after that, right? Absolutely. Um, there's no rhyme or reason. 
It just depends on what happens genetically that first 12 weeks. And we don't know a lot about first trimester pregnancy loss because it's so small. Um, a lot of times it just gets passed through. We don't have a lot of good research on that time um, of gestation. I, I just want to keep re reframing it here. Guys, if you're listening, like you have to appreciate your partner well before any of this takes place. The way you treat your partner it needs to be informed by everything that's going to happen in your future. Don't cause her unnecessary upset if you don't have to, because life is going to smash upset in your face. Um, where should, should we go, go from, from here? here? Well, I was just going to say, on the other hand, too, I have a lot of women who have a lot of infertility. And it's crazy because I see a lot of them alone at their appointments. Where is your partner? I ask that when we do any infertility discussion that you bring your partner with you because it has to be the both of you on this journey together because it is so hard. Women have to go through egg testing, egg retrieval, ultrasounds, dye testing. Um, it's a pretty painful and emotional thing that um, I like to bring the partners in on just so that they know what we're doing. Um, of course, elephant in the room. Age is a huge contributing factor to infertility. Tell us more. Well, um, after 35 is considered advanced maternal age or a geriatric pregnancy, unfortunately. Um, and it's not because you're old, but your eggs get old. So your eggs age with you. Um, you're given a certain amount when you're born and that's it. So if someone comes to see me at 35, obviously they're wanting to try to get this thing going, get it faster. And then unfortunately after 35, more of those will end up in miscarriage because of some sort of component, maybe within the egg, the egg might not be quite as healthy as it was. And so women over 35 sometimes do even have more problems trying to conceive. And and here on the Relationship Advocates podcast, we're, we're huge, pardon, we're huge advocates of people marrying young, getting relationships young and trying to have kids as young as possible but very because of this biological sort of um um clock what are you seeing um sarah um what's what, what am i trying to say here well i'm definitely seeing people waiting to start their families um i, I do feel that that trend is is there like a lot of my patients are much older when they finally start to try um, whether it be because they weren't married or because of profession or anything like that, but it can be much more difficult. Um, I think on the other hand, when you get into relationships, when you're really young, a lot of them can be good, but I think sometimes the person that you are at 18, of course, is not the person that you are at 25. And so, um, picking, so I, I think, I think we just need to be really, really cautious about who we're choosing as our future partner. Like, is this person going to grow with me as I grow? Because if this person isn't, this, this is probably not going to work out. Like you really, you really have to find qualities in someone that you want for a long period of time, because typically people don't change their main behaviors. Agreed. And uh, just I uh, want to add something here in conversations um, I've had with sort of women who are in their 30s the conversation always goes oh, well I know someone who had a baby at this age or 40 or whatever and that's okay but I guess what we're trying to say here is out, like I guess what you're trying to say is the longer you take there's just the more harder it gets sometimes you can't put your finger on the reason why it's hard but it just gets harder so it's not a case of you're definitely not going to have a kid you're going to go through much harder struggles than you otherwise would. Can you bear that burden? That's an issue. Yeah, is that something you guys are going to be willing to work on as a couple? Like, okay, we know we're going to wait to have children. And, you know, for some people, they don't have any trouble, which is great. But um, that's just not the case all the time. And are you guys going to be willing to go through that or, you know, go through egg retrieval in your 20s so that you, you can have a family when you're older? I mean, these all are things that you should discuss, you know, in your relationship. So you both are on the same page. C-sections. How, how common are these? Oh, that depends on the part of the country or the part of the world you're in. Um, 
if there are midwives available, um, midwives drastically reduce the number of C-sections um, that occur. But if you're in, um, there are some countries where C-section is actually the preferred um, way of delivery. Um, we have, I think our percentage with our office is around 19 to 20 percent. Um, we have two midwives though, and so we try to do most of the vaginal deliveries. But C-section can occur for a lot of reasons, especially um, if you are not healthy to begin with and you have to be induced. Um, some babies aren't positioned the right way. Sometimes your placenta is not in a, in a situation where you can um, successfully have a vaginal delivery. There are a lot of reasons for emergency C-section. Um, so it just really depends. And um, I think knowing where you are in the world and knowing what the rates are can be just really helpful to you guys as a couple to know kind of where you want to go. You said if you're not you said if you're not healthy, is that physiology in terms of weight or are we talking about sort of biological health? Weight sometimes, but not necessarily. Um, a lot of people that are, um, you know, we're getting people pregnant with a lot of um, technology. So people that have heart conditions, people that have kidney disease, people that have other things that maybe, like especially heart problems. There are a variety of heart problems that um, pushing can increase your risk of heart trouble and heart attack. So some in some cases, they do recommend C-section there. Um, but no, not necessarily weight. Um, it could be could be anything, especially with an aging population. And, and forgive my ignorance, but I always see it in the movies. It always seems to be a very last minute in the moment decision. How does that normally go down? Are people normally compliant or is something that women try to avoid? I think it depends on how it's presented to you by your provider. Um, there have been times where I have just looked at someone and said, we have to go have a C-section right now. And, and we have consent signed previously. So, um, but I say your baby's in danger or you're going in, or you're going to die if we don't get you back there right away. Other times it can be more um, like not as emergent. We call them just urgent um, where maybe things aren't going right. Um, the baby's not progressing or mom and mom and baby are getting fevers and things like that. And those are definitely not as, as, as rushed, but I have been in my fair share of, we have to get this baby out within minutes. And, and this is really important for guys listening. Cause like women really, and rightfully so everyone does, but can you imagine having to wreck your body in that way? Like body image is a huge for women and how that could potentially affect your relationship or her esteem. These are really things you've got to begin to appreciate way before any of this happens. Like, you know, a, a lot of people in relationships, they they joke about, you know, they banter each other and they'll call their missus fat or whatever or, or disparage in terms about their body. It's a slippery slope. It's not a good tactic. Do not talk, don't, don't disparage women's bodies. Do not do that. Um, our body go, go, we even notice, I mean, just the, the first few weeks of pregnancy, the body starts to change. Maybe not the weight necessarily, but it, it curves in places it didn't used to. And then, um, you know, some women get stretch marks or some women get varicose veins. Um, and these are all things that um, can change, you know, their perception of their body. And then postpartum, they come right back to me and say, you know, I really want to lose this weight. What can I do about these things? And I have to remind them, you know, your body just created this human. Um, we one have to give you time to bond and get to know this baby. Like we don't need to be putting so much pressure on you to get back to what you were, because that is not going to your body's never going to be what it was. Um, but coming to terms to accept like the things that you can control and that you can change and having a supportive partner is really helpful. Um, because girls don't want to hear about their stretch marks. They don't, they know they're there. They know they're there. They don't want to hear about the extra little weight that they're carrying, but you know what? Maybe they're breastfeeding. Maybe they're taking care of two other children. Um, there are many things that go into that and you have to know that that's just the part of life. We were created to have humans and you know, the body sometimes changes because of it. And, and one thing I've noticed, um, for women that are informed, young women, normally the common, the, uh, uh, one of the factors, the reason why they want to delay having babies is because they don't want to wreck their body. 
But women who've had children talk of the absolute joys of having a child. Um, and it's just more ignorance of people, not men or women, just not knowing, just not being willing to l listen to people who've been through it. Because like the trade-off between, and I can't make this trade-off because I'm not a woman, but women should be making this trade-off in their minds, the joy and magic of having a baby versus perhaps losing yourself physically for a while. I mean, is that even a, is that even a competition? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I knew the possibilities, but I, I knew I wanted to be a mother. I knew I wanted to do that. And so I was willing to go for it and see what would happen because you never know what's going to happen to each pregnant woman. And I'm not going to say it wasn't hard. Um, after the second one, your my body changed even more and it was a lot harder to come to deal with that. But over the years, um, as I've gotten older, I've been able to appreciate what my body did for me. Um, but yeah, I think in your 20s too, if you're if you're just, you know, worried about your vanity, then, then that's where you're at and, and that's okay. But, you know, I think age does change a few things and if it never does, well, then maybe being, being a parent isn't the right thing for you. Let, let me just frame this again. When you're qualifying and you're in your journey to finding the one, ladies, if, you're, if your relationship is simply built on lust and the way you look, it's a losing game. As soon as you have that baby, as soon as that man does not have access to that lustful attraction anymore your 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 relationships in jeopardy so recognize where we all will end up we're all going to end up here just face that and now reverse engineer the qualities that you need in the man in order to make sure you can have a long-term relationship and, and that means it needs to be more than just looks it needs to be a friendship it needs to be a partnership um and you know even a lot of the women that i talk to have an interesting problem with their partners because their partners will gain weight um, while they're pregnant and that changes their opinion of their partner so it does go both ways um so yeah if you guys just really don't like each other in the beginning it's not going to get fixed by having children that's incredible um I, I understand correct me if i'm wrong the longer one leaves sort of if you have kids younger rather than older the skin has more buoyance and it's easier to lose weight post-pregnancy totally dependent on a bunch of other factors to weight beginning weight after genetics um genetically is your skin predisposed are you genetically predisposed to stretch marks um but you have to think of it yeah as you age your skin just isn't as as tight as it once was, you know, it's wrinklier. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely the older you are, um, things are going to be a little different than maybe if you had a baby at 20. Postpartum body, vaginal discharge. You've said we've spoken about varicose veins, urinary incontinence, hair loss, skin discoloring. So urinary incontinence is actually something that's really common for women when they're actually even pregnant. And many of the times it will resolve, but it's from the pressure on the bladder, just from the weight of the baby. Because you have to think about it, that uterus sits on top of the bladder. And as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, if your bladder's full, you just may leak a little bit. A lot of the times though, most women um, don't have problems with it after, or they can develop problems later in life. And it doesn't necessarily worsen for people who've had a vaginal delivery. It could happen if you've had a C-section because it's from the pressure during the pregnancy. Um, but about 10% will, will go on. And sometimes genetics plays a role in that too. Does your mom have leakage? Um, I always recommend my women do who have that issue right after we do physical floor physical therapy to help strengthen the muscles of the lower uh, uterine abdomen just to get everything kind of as good as it can be. Um, and then there are corrective surgeries. Um, but honestly, the people that need that when they're younger is very, very small. And what I found, found interesting, I know you've already touched on it, but like the varicose veins, like even if you're fit as a fiddle, you can still get varicose veins. 
yeah, it's just blood flow. So, and if your mom, if you look at her and she's got varicose veins, you might get them too. Um, but it's just the pressure from the extra fluid because you have about two to three extra liters of fluid when you're pregnant and it has to go somewhere. And if you're standing all day, guess where it's gonna go? Right to your feet and ankles. It's actually very common too to have them in the vulva. Um, and they're very, very painful. Um, especially during the pregnancy. We have a lot, a lot of people wear um, compression stockings and compression hose for their vagina, just so that they can um, be comfortable. Again, ladies, again, ladies, physical aspects, careful what you're building the foundation of your relationships upon. Come on, be more aware. We're all gonna end up here. The biggest one, ladies, hair loss. So hair loss is mostly common about three to four months after a delivery, and that is from the stress of the pregnancy, the delivery, the breastfeeding. A lot of the times, though, that will resolve on its own. But that can that can be an issue up to four months afterwards, right? Yeah. And there's nothing we can do about it, unfortunately. It's just the stress and loss of, you know, um, but a lot of women um, do get better. Um, we do have some people with different conditions that have high testosterone that will have hair loss and we, we can, you know, we can send them to a dermatologist. There's things we can do, but um, hair loss um, can really impact the way that you view yourself. And um, I wish it wouldn't because all women are beautiful, but um, you know, we all have things that we look at ourselves and wish we could be better or wish we could have better. And so that's just the nature, I think, of being human. So, And, and again, I think for guys watching, like, if, if you can't, you know, you have to make your partner feel beautiful at the time, at, at, at the, during the peace time, you know, you, you, you can't just start laying it on thick afterwards because then it's just not, I mean, I'm sure it is genuine, but I guess just appreciate women and what they represent and the struggle they are going to end up um, having to go through um, way before this has to happen, you know, make them feel comfortable. So, so it will, cause gosh, I mean, God, people do care about how they look. Can you imagine having something happen to you that you just can't help as a result of this amazing thing that you've just given birth to? It's the biggest oxymoron, like, you know, can you imagine the internal conflicts? Guys, come on, wake up. Let's appreciate women a bit more. Well, uh, and I think the most interesting thing is I think how men view the women directly after birth. Because I don't think there's many situations prior to that where they see their partner in that amount of pain and discomfort and sometimes makes them sick because they are not comfortable with it. They just can't deal with that. And then afterwards they're like, that was amazing like that was the coolest thing i've ever seen so um i think it's really important that they do be in the room to see that because unfortunately i've had some women pick their mothers or their sisters especially in this time of of, of quarantine um, because they feel like their mother or sister would be their better support person so when you're thinking about picking a partner like this person needs to be with you and be your support person so i feel like that's also important Exactly. And men have to know, like, there is a small chance that you may pass away from childbirth. It's very, very scary. Not not long ago, used to be very, very common. Yes. Yes. And unfortunately, it's still too common that I've seen it enough in my 15-year career um, to be sickened by it because, um, you know, we have all this technology and all these things. And sometimes, you know, even though we do our best, we still can't prevent that. Again, guys, God, I don't, I shouldn't have to keep reframing it, but you've got to start, you know, uh, as I've started to learn more and more about women and relationships as a whole, you know, when I see a, a strange, a, a, a stranger in the street, I just, I just can't help but feel filled with adora admiration, you know, like of what, what women have to go through. Um, uh, vaginal tearing. Oh, so yeah, that's, yeah, Guys, that's listen that, up. Yeah, that worries a lot of people. Um, and that's a lot of things that we talk about, you know, during pregnancy is what are the ways to reduce that? Because women are scared of it. They've heard awful things about it. Okay. There's, there's four kinds of tears and, um, the first tear, which is fairly mild, but can occur. And I have a model. Do you mind if I grab it? No, sure. Yeah, please. Yeah. You've got loads of models. I've seen your TikToks. 
<laughs> Someone asked if they could come on and just be my model all the time. <laughs> So um, this is the vulva and this is the vagina. And so a first degree tear is something that is just really going to go through the skin. So very minor. Um, we, we do stitch it up together, but it's very minor, maybe it may cause some discomfort. A second degree tear or sometimes what an episiotomy will lead to is a second degree. So not only does it go through the skin, but it also goes through some of the muscle. Okay, and not everyone's vulva or vagina tears in a straight line. So you could have one of these, you could have a couple of these. Now the third type is worse because it actually goes down into the rectal capsule. So not only do we have to suture all the muscle, we have to suture the capsule as well. And then a fourth degree goes all the way through into the actual rectum. So we pretty much have to rebuild the rectum, the rectal capsule, the vagina, and then the surface. And it is horribly painful. Now a first and second degree, like I said, those are more common tears. Nothing's ever been out of there. Sometimes you do get, you know, a little, a little tear somewhere. Um, but the third and fourth degree can take six to 12 weeks for even women to even feel like there's just no pain down there. And then this is the other part, the head comes out like this. So sometimes you can get a tear here, a tear here, or a tear through the clitoris. And those are all very painful. So we use a lot of um, perineal support, perineal compression. Um, I'm sure you've seen on my TikToks, I have a lot of gel and mineral oils and, and things. Um, but depending on the size of the baby, depending on the way the baby's coming out, like last night I had a baby come out with its hand on its head, just like this. So, you know, that hit stuff on the way out. So you have to just be aware that those things will happen. Now the vagina is super resilient, thank goodness, and it will heal and it will go back to what it was. It's amazing. But for those first like eight to 12 weeks, it is really, really uncomfortable. So trying to imagine breastfeeding, caring for a baby, caring for your other children while having this pain after we reconstructed your rectum. I just want to scream at you all. Like I'm not seeing people making the right decisions when they're choosing their partners. Like I hope this, these stories scare you into submission and make you a bit more diligent in the partners you're choosing. Cause it is very important. Um, I know we've touched on it, but um, apparently one in seven people have postpartum depression slash psychosis. Yes, I have seen psychosis twice in my whole 15 year career. And um, it was very scary. Most of the time I deal with postpartum blues, postpartum anxiety, which is lumped I think into postpartum depression, but we don't talk about it enough. Um, but your whole life changes. You go home after one to two days with this new person who you have to take care of. You still have to take care of you, your partner. And if you don't have a supportive partner, you just feel so isolated and so alone. And with the pandemic, like families weren't able to help as much. And so people were just feeling so alone. And that really is a breeding ground for those things. We always bring our patients back a little early, but some people don't even bring their patients back for four, six, eight weeks postpartum. So it'd be really hard for me to recognize a change in them. Um, and it's crazy because I had a lady come to me one time who said, Sarah, I don't want to live anymore. And I said, well, do you have a way that you're going to do it? And she said, yeah, I, I have some pills I'm going to take. And I said, well, have you written a note? She said, I wrote a note and left it for my husband at the house before I came and saw you. And I said, well, let me call your husband and let's tell him that he needs to take you immediately to the emergency room so that we can get you some treatment. And she said, he won't take me. He doesn't believe me. That was like, what? Um... So it's now my job to get women care despite their partner as well. 
and I'm sure some partners would be different, but I've had two instances where I've actually had to have the police come and escort them to the hospital because their partner refused because they were just making it up or being dramatic. Uh, this isn't a call for a wake up call for ladies. I, I don't know what is. Um, can you just give us a, I, I know it's hard to do a distinction between them, but uh, baby blues is very common. Super common. You cry when you, I mean, I, when I had my babies, Oprah was still on. So I'd watch Oprah and just cry and cry for no reason. Or I'd turn on the news. Like I had to stop watching Dateline for a while, you know, um, postpartum anxiety set in for me when I had my son, um, I was scared. I was scared of everything. I was scared of him not breathing. I was scared he was going to fall down the stairs. And um, it got to a point where that's where all my thoughts were consumed. And I was frightened. But I loved this kid. I wanted to take care of him. I wanted to take care of myself. But I um, sought out treatment and was able to get help with the anxiety. The depression, um, and some people are sad. They don't get to go out with their friends anymore. Their life has been altered. Those are very normal things. But when you don't get out of bed all day, when you don't want to take care of your baby, when you don't want to take care of yourself, when you no longer just care at all, that is a serious problem and you need to go talk to your doctor. And unfortunately, where I am in the country, there are not a lot of mental health professionals. So I tend to have to be a mental health professional for the minor situations or the situations that maybe I feel that we can start off with because I just don't have a lot of places to send people. The one place I have is over an hour away. The, 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 the thing that I learned, which was a thing that said to me, I have to have someone in the know to come on and talk about this. This was the thing that did it for me. Pubitonomy, pubic symphysis. Yes. So thank goodness that most people do not do that anymore. Um, but you know, that's why the chainsaw was invented was to actually cut the pubic bone. Like that was like the first model of the chainsaw. And because when a baby would be stuck, no one knew how to get it out. And so there's this little ligament in between the bones and it's soft and you can cut through it. We have since developed better ways to help get babies out with C-section or different maneuvers to help us um, release the baby. Sometimes that does inv involve breaking a clavicle on the baby or breaking an arm. Um, but that can end up being less traumatic than having to cut through someone's pubic bone. Ouch. Wow. And that, that the sort of breaking of the baby's arm or, or clavicle, that's uh, how common is that? Oh, uh, not common, only done in case of a severe emergency. So let's say the baby's head comes out and then uh, the shoulders get stuck in the bigger part of the um, pubic bone. Well, you can pull all you want, but stuck is stuck. So you either have to try to rotate the baby to fit better. And sometimes you have to try to go in and grab an arm to come out. But if it's stuck and it will not come out, you're also probably not gonna be able to get it out C-section either because the baby's already partially way through the canal. So sometimes if when you're trying to deliver an arm, you may break an arm, you may break a clavicle. It's definitely not something that any of us try to do, um, but it does happen. It's very, it's fairly rare. Um, we have definitely other methods to use, but um, that's definitely a lot more common than, than cutting through the pubic bone. I read that childbirth is like breaking 20 bones at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm probably the only, or one of the only midwives you'll meet that, that's had two epidurals. Um, I thought, hey, I'm going to go try this and see what happens. And I, I couldn't handle it. It was awful. And even with the epidural, um, I still have a little bit of PTSD just because of the amount of pressure that I didn't know, even as a professional, that I was going to feel um, going through that pain. And then he broke he broke the little part of my tailbone. <laughs> we all heard that pop. Couldn't sit straight for two years after that. 
So yeah, it hurts. But on the other hand, I've seen women walk in and hop in a bathtub and deliver a baby just fine. So pain tolerance is is definitely individualized. Um, is the is the sort of worse of birth versus and also can you just for viewers who don't know what an epidural is, uh, explain that. And and is there a uh, just what just what is water birth better, easier? necessarily i think it totally depends on how you view pain and if if you enjoy baths and if you enjoy warmth then definitely um they've shown that water studies that water birth can be um very relaxing to women um we also have you know like birthing balls that you can sit on to help take pressure off a lot of women labor on the toilet just because of the way that the toilet is it kind of takes pressure off um and then we do have like some iv medication that we can give before an epidural if someone desires but an epidural is where they take um, a needle and then thread a catheter into um, the epidural space of the back and they inject medicine that usually is um, they give little doses over it for the entire course of the labor so it doesn't wear off it's usually attached to a pump just like an iv would um, but it will the goal is for it to make the contractions go away or to numb them enough that you can relax. I've seen some people with epidurals that can't feel anything from their stomach to their toes. Um, some people can still move around. So just depending on where they where they get you and what nerves they hit or where they get you in that space and what large dose they give you can depend on your movement and labor. But then that becomes sometimes a problem when you have like those emergency situations and you really need to move somebody, sometimes you can't move them. So you have to do what you can do to help get the baby out without cooperation from, from the mom. Bowel movements during pregnancy. Almost 98% of the time it happens. And honestly, it's it means that they're pushing the right way because the baby's head literally pressures um, puts pressure on the rectum so if there's any stool in the rectum it comes out there you go ladies so you know and we just wipe of... it away we don't say anything we just wipe it away i'm just trying to like frame it here for people who don't understand what's coming like this is a beautiful amazing magical thing but you're worried about nonsense you're chasing an idiot and this is this is where we're going to end up. But you're chasing an idiot who doesn't have any respect for you because you don't respect yourself. Come on, ladies. Come on. Won't even look. They're like, I don't want to see that. I'm like, oh, OK, well, but it's a beautiful thing. I mean, watching your child be born. I get if you don't want to see the aftermath or me doing what I'm doing afterwards. But to watch your child be born is pretty awesome. And I had a dad the other day that actually helped me deliver his baby. That's incredible. Um, <laughs> I think I'd like to do that. Don't speak too soon. I'd, I'd try my best. Um, you touched on it at the start. You mentioned that sometimes when you have a miscarriage, you actually have to have to give birth to the to the miscarried baby. Yeah. So depending on um, where you're at, what the ethics are, um, how big the baby is. So we have a patient that had a loss. Um, after the first trimester at 18 weeks and so she had to go to the labor and delivery unit get all the medicine and had to deliver the baby at 18 weeks how was that for her it's awful every time i do it it's awful um the lady in question i mean she's trying again is she, is, is she... she did and we were successful the next time but we ended up with a really really preterm baby the next time um, her issue tended to be with the shape of her uterus. Um, it just wasn't able to hold a full-term baby. But we do have a baby now. Brilliant. But it's heartbreaking sitting there crying with someone. It's it's heartbreaking. I can see, like when you when you're touching on some of the stories, I can see the emotion that like you're taking yourself back to those memories, and I can't I can only imagine because it I must it must be so dense for you because that's what you do regularly. You know, it's not like. Uh, a once in a while thing you see it all the time mm -hmm. uh, and that's, i think that's the part of my job that people too don't understand like yeah i mean most of the time happy 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 you know but we 
but we do get these really awful things that happen. And I mean, it definitely makes my patient and I closer and we have this relationship. And of course I would rather, I would rather be there with her than not because you know, like I'm her support, but it's still hard. A uh, message to uh, prospective fathers, men, what can we do during this pregnancy, uh, childbirth, sorry, how can we prepare ourselves? What can we do? Any message to men or, or good stories that you have to sort of set the standard? Go to the classes. If they're going to go to classes, go to the classes. Just being aware of like what's going to happen, what you might see, what you might not see. Um, that will get put in the classes. Um, I did not have my husband go to classes because I was already a seasoned labor and delivery nurse. And that poor guy had no idea what to do. Um, he just stood there, which was fine. I mean, honestly, with Nolan, I was in so much pain. I was just like, just leave me alone. Like, I don't like get away. But but he was just so like freaked out because I didn't explain any of it to him. And then with Reagan, <laughs> She was born in like a few hours. He's like, oh, that was easy. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> things not to say, right? Things not to say, not, not super easy. But I think just um, asking them, what are your, what are the ways that you like to, um, what are the things you like to do when you're in pain? So do you like to have someone talk to you? Make them write down things that they can say to you. Some people do Bible verses. Some people do lyrics out of, um, or songs, or some people want a movie playing, you know, just have your partner know the things that you want and help them tell them too. like, they're your advocate. So if something's going on in the labor, like give them a job, like it's your job to make sure that I'm hydrated. It's your job to make sure that I'm eating. It's your job to make sure that this happens, like give them a role too. And don't just let them be hanging in the corner like my poor husband too. How long can childbirth last? days um uh if we have to induce someone that's not quite ready because of a medical condition three to four days i've seen are we talking about three to four days sort of on the edge pushing like no but in the hospital contracting uncomfortable waiting 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 most people most first-time moms will push usually the max is like two to three hours Constant, Constant pushing, pushing, like, like intervals, intervals yeah. yeah. So yeah, in intervals. So yeah, you you do get a break. Um, but usually, second babies, third babies, you know, they are, they usually do come out much faster. I push for two hours with Nolan and only twice with Reagan. So um, it's really different. But then when you get into these larger pregnancies too, there's more room in there. There's more space. Sometimes babies will. We've had a baby flip breech on us in like the labor room and so we've had to do like an emergency c-section so there's never like a constant i think you always just have to be ready for change like you can't just be like oh everything's going great because most of the time it will but sometimes you know weird things happen or the baby's heart rate goes down or mom starts bleeding and then i think postpartum hemorrhage is probably the one thing that i've seen men have the hardest time dealing with because they're in the room while we're trying to save their partner's life while they're they're essentially bleeding to death in the labor room. Gosh. And it's hard to be their support while you're trying to, you know, take care of their partner. Of course, yeah, I, I've seen uh, some clips like men will faint and you guys have just got to crack on. You've got to call someone else to sort that idiot out, yeah. This has been fantastic. I've learned so much and a new, even more appreciation for women. Before you go, Sarah, we'd like your best relationship advice for our viewers. Listen to each other and don't think that your way is always the best way. Perfect. It's been incredible. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge. Thank you guys for having me on. I appreciate it. Take care now. Bye now. Thanks.